Well, we're standing in the Chapel of St Thomas, which has been here for a long time, and the uh, men whose pictures you can see around the um, rafters, they would have worshipped in this chapel 100 years ago. Um, so it's a, it's a very special place and it's nice to feel that um, they, they've been here and, and we're continuing that tradition. And the people, the photographs we can see, these were people who came to this school but also worked here as well? Yes, there were um, three of the uh, of, our, of our casualties were actually uh, members of staff, two of the masters and uh, Robert Quine who was the school porter. There is something incredibly poignant about having these faces looking down at you and getting a sense of just one community, this school community, that was just hit devastatingly. Yes, it's, it's absolutely incredible, the, uh, the uh, scale of the sacrifice. Um, 546 uh, members of the King Williams College community served in the First World War and 139 of them were killed. That's 25%, which is actually the, almost the highest percentage of any public school in the whole of Britain. Goodness me, absolutely incredible. And you've been researching this for four years. There must be some stories that stand out for you. Yes, I mean, there are some, it, every story is, is interesting and, and, and poignant. Um, for example, George Margerison, who was the son of Kroger House, who was uh, killed on the 8th of November 1918, three days before the armistice. Um, Charles Moody, who was uh, in the Royal Flying Corps, he was 18. He'd been out of school less than six months when he was killed in combat. Um, Ashley McGain, who was a schoolmaster from Port Erin, and he wrote a letter which we have um, to his mother the night before he was killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. I mean, every every single story is, is heartbreaking. We had uh, William Rigby, who uh, led the Chorley Pals um, to the railway station after battle with Ned, the uh, battalion's mascot, and we've got photographs of him leading them through the snow to go off to war. William Shakespeare, who's uh, one of our very famous old boys who fought in Saudi Arabia and was killed riding in battle on his camel. Um, I mean, the stories, each one is, is interesting, but, but also so sad. And you reel off these names, you, you know the, the names, you know the stories. This has obviously become quite a personal project for you as well. Yes, I, I really feel that it's it's really been important to put names to the faces or faces to the names because they, they're on the war memorial, names and initials. When we first started back in 2014, our role of honour had surnames and initials and we've be, you know, been able to find first names and sometimes even nicknames um, for each of them, photographs. Um, we've managed to get in touch with families all around the world, people in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, as well as people on the island. I mean, obviously, with some of the surnames of these boys, um, you know, Taggart, Tear, Shimin, Quine, there there are obviously relatives, you know, on the island still. It's been amazing, I think, for everybody to actually now look at them and know them. And when when their names are read out, um, when we read the Roll of Honour at the beginning of the Remembrance Service, people can actually they recognise the names and can actually um, put an, a face to those names. What impact has this work had on students here? Um, we've had lots of interest from from all kinds of students, and I think um, it's. I hope it's it's brought the the war and the, and history alive a little bit to them. Um, try to. Um, let them see the human side of things and the actual devastation. I, we A couple of years ago, uh, during our remembrance service, I remember reading out Ashley McGain's letter to his mother uh, the, the night before he went into battle and died, and it was in incredibly moving. I mean, it, it really, it, I think it affected people of all ages. You can't even comprehend what this many people look like almost. It's also looking at the variety of faces, the ages, the difference that you can tell they're from different backgrounds, you know, and some of them, I assume, were very young when they went off to war. Yes, absolutely. I, I added them up the other day and I can't quite remember, but I mean, about 60 or some, so under 25 or 25 and under. Yes, we had some older men who'd, who'd retired but then signed up again, re-enlisted. There was, there's such a, a variety of, of backgrounds as well. Um, I mean, we had uh, Sir Archibald Campbell, who was a baronet, and then uh, Ashley McGain, who was a railway porter's son. They came from many different backgrounds. Quite a few of our old boys had emigrated around the world. They had gone to Australia, to New Zealand. They'd gone to Canada, but they all enlisted 
enlisted and came back to Europe and fought with their various um, overseas forces. They, they fought all over the world. We have people who died in France and Flanders, obviously, but also in Mesopotamia, in Iraq. They're in Egypt, they're in Gallipoli, in Turkey. And of course, not to forget the men who served in the Navy. We had Walter Scott, who was one of I was our second casualty, and he was killed when his ship was fired on off the coast of Chile um, in the Battle of Coronel right at the beginning in 1st of November 1914 with the loss of 900 and something lives. The thing that's really striking me is the number of women that were left behind and their, and the children as well that just had to carry on. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I was reading something the other day and I think they said in 1922 something like um, only 10% of women in their early 20s would be able to ex- could expect to marry. Um, so in other words, 90% of women of that generation probably weren't going to find a husband. It's a whole generation of women who lost out on that opportunity. You mentioned the Remembrance Service where the names will be read out, but we're also um, standing by some boots, some, uh, they look like army boots, which have photographs attached to them and poppies. Tell us about these. Well, David Dawson, one of our um, members of staff, our theatre manager, um, came up with the idea that it would be lovely to um, collect 139 pairs of boots, one for each life lost, and then we could... um, put a photograph and a, and a poppy on them and place them around school during this week so that people just come across them and walk past them and can have a moment to reflect on that person. And it's, it's very, very, very visual and it's, it's very effective. And what we plan to do is um, to line them all up um, as uh, for our remembrance service outside so that as people come into chapel they'll walk past this huge long line of 139 pairs of boots. You still need some more boots though? Yes I'm afraid we still are after boots we could probably do with about another 100 pairs so if anybody would like to donate some boots to us either boots that they want back in which case they could label them and we will return them or if they decide they don't want them back anymore if they could let us know that they want to donate them um, we've been asked if we could donate unwanted boots for the refugees for this winter so we'd love to do that so um, we'll we'll happily donate them afterwards. And what sort of boots are you looking for just to clarify that? Well obviously if you've got something that remotely resembles an army boot that would be great but um, sort of muddy old walking boots or or riding boots anything really that could pass as a boot that might have served in the trenches would would be appropriate so long as um, men's boots yeah. And tell us as well about these beautiful stones that have been painted here. I'm holding one now. It has the name Archibald McFarlane on it. And there's a picture of a soldier and a poppy on there. Tell us about these. Mrs Morgan's, actually, Anya Morgan's, our head of sixth form, was telling me about the popularity of painting stones at the moment and and thought, could we do something uh, for our remembrance um, this year? And so Mr Kelly, our head of art, has been actually able to transfer the photographs onto the stones which are beautiful and then he's painted poppies and some of his students his art students have been writing the names Um, and we've even had some of the students requesting whether they could actually do the stone for a particular um, man because they've sat opposite his his photograph in chapel three times a week and and would like to actually remember him particularly And uh, what we intend to do with the stones is um, before our remembrance service on Friday, the members of the sixth form, the pupils, are going to uh, walk around our war memorial and place each stone around the war memorial before we have our service. What a lovely idea. So after the remembrance service, what will happen with these pictures? Are they they going to stay here and can the public come and see them? As as far as I'm concerned, I I think it would be lovely if they stay here. They sort of feel part of, they're just Mm. part of the community. Um, I'll see what everybody else thinks, if they're happy for them to remain. Um, That would be wonderful. Um, I'm sure if people would like to come and see them, um, you know, they could come, uh, maybe contact the school and we could arrange for them to, to see them. Um, Also, in addition to our normal school remembrance service, which happens on the Friday afternoon, this Sunday um, evening on the actual 11th of November at 5.30, we're going to have a candlelit uh, sort of requiem, um, an an event where we um, listen to poems and letters written by 
um, our casualties and their families and we're going to have lots and lots of photographs that have, haven't been seen before, some of them from family albums of some of these men, and interspersed with some beautiful music and set to candlelight. So I hope it will be a very, very moving um, and lovely uh, way to give them a send off at the end of this centenary. And um, we would like to extend the welcome to everybody to come and join us. And particularly, we would love to see any uh, relatives of our um, 139 fallen. Um, it would be lovely for them to join us here. And this has been a project of yours, as you say, for the past four years or so. It's by no means complete, though. No, um, it's it's real labour of love, I'm, and I'm afraid it's, it, there's so much research goes into it, and then to actually compile the biographies that I'm trying to uh, create for our archives. Um, I think I'm about a third of the way through, so I think I'll be going for a, a few years yet. But it's it's so rewarding, and I really feel you know that it, it's something that we do now um, to create the the link to history for the future because um, otherwise it's it's lost and there's we're, we're able still there are relatives who remember uh, um, and so those those people's testimonies their photographs the things they tell us are so valuable otherwise they'll be lost forever do you um, mind taking us outside and we'll have a look at the war memorial absolutely yes let's go have a look Here we are, it's just outside the chapel, and I wonder if for you now this has even more significance. Oh, absolutely, because I, I look at every name and I can, I can see their faces. Um, the, the initials actually mean something. It's obvious when, of course, you see them alphabetically um, that we had uh, brothers. There are seven pairs of brothers from the school, which you can see, so that makes it even more poignant. You actually know the stories. <laughs> 